Um, I'm really happy to be here with you um, and to have about 20 minutes to walk you through the mysterious world of uh, big data, big data driven medicine and alike. And I'd like to start with uh, two gadgets here. You know what that's, this is? You know what this is? Anybody? No, this is not an iPhone. This is a medical device. You know what this is? This is a mass spectrometer in the form of the pocket size. I will come to this in my presentation later. I just put that here because these are the main tools that will guide us through the ideas of um, the internet of healthy things and big data driven medicine. Now, the company that I founded is called the Healthcare Futurists. Um, don't get me wrong, I cannot predict the future. If I could, I would probably not be standing here. I would already own an island in the Caribbean Sea because I knew the numbers of the lottery and all the raffles in advance. So um, we talk about predictions here. And predictions are especially difficult if they pertain to the future, which is what I'm talking about today. And uh, we can't predict the future, but we're trying to be there when the future is being made and when it happens. And there's a lot of people in history that have come up with remarkable inventions and then again got the potential completely wrong. So this is Gottlieb Daimler, the guy who invented the, um, the car, and he is supposed to have said that um, the global demand for personal cars will not exceed one million just because of the lack of available chauffeurs. So he got the great idea, but he did not know how to exploit this idea in the first place. But he was not alone. There are other people out there, um, supposed to be important figures at IBM, who, are, who have said, I think uh, there is a world market for maybe five computers, which is one of the founding fathers of IBM. Maybe it's five Watson computers at the end of the day that we probably be needing in order to save all mankind. But then again, obviously, this also was not correct. So our mission is we try to comprehend and to change. Comprehension means to touch things, to work with things, to roll up sleeves. I'm a surgeon by training and surgeons are known to be the guys rolling up the sleeves and fumbling in people's guts. And uh, it's about us, it's we. You can't do this on your own. You need to work together. It is about saving, it is about patience. So this is pretty much the core of the presentation that I'm going to talk about. We are called healthcare futurists. We are explorers and strategists. We are adventurers in the field of healthcare. And all we all have a good education. We all work in well-paid jobs. And again, we try to get things done, things that are not on usual business plans. And I'm reckon that amongst this great audience here are 300 people. There's at least 50 healthcare futurists at heart. So if you feel compelled to talk with me after that presentation, come see me. There's a lot of things that we can change together. We're located in Cologne. We have an office in Berlin, and we're now moving to the United States in order to get healthcare and global things done. Now, medicine lives in innovation, and this is innovation day, so I need to start with innovation. Medicine lives in innovation, but healthcare systems live on regulations. And you've all heard this, and you've all been there, so I'm preaching to the choir here. But I need to make that point again because change is great as long as everything remains the same for me. This is what I learned in a lot of companies that I've been working at and that I've been working for. But innovation is an honor. It does not belong to museum. So you need to get your grips together on innovation. And how does innovation happen in the first place? Well, innovation means modeling it's the uncommon things within the common things. So this is, you walk down the road, you look at a house, look at the top of the house, you see windows in a certain area that you have not looked at before, and that something happens in your mind. This is kids' questions like, Daddy, what time is it on the sun right now? You've probably not thought about that before, but then, then again, what time is it on the sun right now? Or, where was the diesel engine before it was actually invented? Well, I never thought about that. So, how does innovation work? Now, we collect data, bits and pieces, points, hints, 
And these are small data here. And what we're doing, we're trying to make sense of these data by distilling. So we're trying to put them in order. Our whole life consists of making sense. Our whole coping behavior consists of making sense out of what's out there, what's happening in our life. But does this make a lot of sense? Probably not. This makes sense. So you have the same data, you arrange the data differently. And this is pretty much the core of big data. Now I could stop my presentation at that point because you all got the point, and we could go and have a drink, but there's more. So, how innovative are you? If I go about and ask people at a bar, how innovative are you? Well, actually, I am innovative, they would say. My company is not innovative, but I am innovative. All right, now let's go, let's do a test here. So this is a test that was administered to two graders. Elementary school, two graders, seven years old. And it says, the clown has a problem, can you help him solve it? This was a math class, okay? So the, the clown has a couple of balls, one, and it says one, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, fifteen. So if I say, well, who has a solution? Who can help the clown solve it? Some people would raise their hands, and then they'd probably say, well, it's actually three, and it's five, and it's seven, and so forth. Say, well, piece of cake. Well, not for everybody. If you are an autistic person, this is a nightmare for you. Not because you can't do math, but because the question causes something in your brain, which is what we call reframing. So, what do seven, uh, what do two graders, second graders with an autistic trait answer to this question? The clown is a problem, can you help them solve it? No, I can't, I'm not a psychotherapist. Okay, so this is innovation, you need to reframe things. And there's more that I could be telling you, but we are in a company context here. Companies tend to lead mind change um, to sustain competition. So it's about competition. You need to come up with some kind of mind change, and sometimes you need to throw away your business plans. Even if they're close to your work, you need to throw them away. There's Nokia, which used to produce rubber boots. And then they started using cell phones. So they threw their ideas, their business, their business plans away. And innovation doesn't work in an instant. It doesn't mean there's not a market. This is what I'm, I'm telling a lot of people who are trying to harvest an innovation too early. Because what, what could be happening is this. So you need to make sure you understand the market you're acting in. And healthcare is a great market. But it's a very segmented market. And it's a very regulated market. So don't give up too early. A disruption, this is what we're talking about, disruption, especially a digital one, oftentimes starts with getting rid of the middleman. And this is what we're doing, getting rid of the middleman. And the car industry will be disrupted a number of times. The taxi industry is already disrupted through Uber. The car industry is probably going to be disrupted through, uh, through autonomous driving. What does it mean for the taxi industry? Do we need any taxi drivers anymore? Probably not. What does it mean for the inner cities? It means much more space, because if you don't need to own a car, and you share the car, and you get the car, and then you need the car, you don't need a car to sit in front of your house 98% of the time, congesting the roads and blocking bypassers and, and um, um, bicycle drivers. So, Disruption, we get rid of the man in the middle also through eBay. It's a nightmare for retail, but it happens. And this all happens through digital innovation. This all happens through big data. And we get rid of banks. It might not be Bitcoin, but it might be something different. Banks have not done so good in the last couple of years. So people start asking questions, why do we actually have bans and banks in the first place? To give tax money away to save them? Probably not. And telecommunication will change. You all know these booths, and you probably all know the, the, the German yellow telephone booth of the old days. They have gone. We're now working with these kind of things, augmented virtual reality, Skype, and so forth. So we get rid of this kind of middleman. And even dating is disrupted. So you don't go to parties to, to meet a significant other. You make it more effective, and you try to go and find somebody through online dating. And in healthcare, about three weeks ago, we had a significant judge ruling from the European uh, court, and healthcare is slowly disrupted, and one of the disruptors is Doc Morris. 
And the question is, who is going to be the man in the middle in healthcare in the first place? So, who are we going to get rid of in healthcare? I have a prediction to make, but I'm not going to disclose this publicly. So we are not too late for the future, but we might be too slow. If this is an average company, steady growth, this is what you're looking for. This is a startup company. This are, these are companies like Google, like Apple, like Amazon, and some others who are disruptors, digital disruptors in healthcare. And so what we need is a new blood, fresh blood transfusion. We need new ideas, new cells, and new transformation coming in into our organisms. But then again, uh, pay attention, especially on the loading dose, because there might be immune reactions against new ideas, not the innovations. And you probably all have, have had that either in your own company or with companies you've been working with. So what is so special about healthcare? Now, healthcare is very regulated, and it's governed by politics, by doctors, by nurses, by professionals. And this is the problem we have. No parking, doctors only. Who said healthcare is for doctors only? We're talking about a lot of healthcare reformation, but a reform, a reform is something very passive. What happens right here is a reformation. It's very active what's happening. And it's probably not happening on the basis of physicians, but it's happening on the basis of patients. Because the physicians are right now trying to get from God to guide. And this empowers patients. And this is a very narcissistic trait here. Because if you went through medical school for six years, and if you did a residency for six years, you are closer to God than anybody, is what you think. And you know more about the disease than your patient does. Because you speak Latin, and you know the Latin first and second name of the disease. So, healthcare is for everyone, not just for doctors. So this is why I say, Viva la Reformación, it's a reformation. How does this reformation happen? Well, 500 years of Luther, so I'm just looking back into history. Letters and data, words and information, and action based on it is knowledge. So what we do is we spread the word. We spread the word about diseases. People consult Dr. Google. And of course, the problem is being able to read does not necessarily mean being able to understand what you read. But then again, people still read. And they still make up their minds whether Dr. Google is right or wrong. Doesn't matter to them. Reformers do order a new. Reformators create new things. And here we are reformators. We're creating new things. We're creating new technology. And the next reformation is digital. And it's going to be a precursor for a revolution. And the next reformation is going to happen in healthcare, digital healthcare. So this is the old church window. This is the industry, this is the pharmacist, the pharmaceutical industry that claims to the attributes of power. And this is the payout, the insurance, the sick funds, they gather money, they do the rules and regulations, and stuck in between is a Christ-like figure. I took Jim Morrison from the doors for that. A Christ-like figure who says, well, I just want to heal. I do not want to be interfered with money or administrative work. I just want to be there for the patient. But that's not, unfortunately not, how healthcare works anymore. It's digital. And healthcare is one of the biggest growth factors in the industry still. So this is why so many companies and other industry players try to engage in healthcare and try to get a share of what's happening there. You're probably all familiar with the Gardner life cycle, hype cycle curve. But before we get to virtual reality and augmented reality, we need to go to digitalization first. And this is the good news for a company like your company. Because every sector of healthcare will be subject to digitalization if you produce pills or plasters, if you do um, exams, if you order pills, if you send pills, if you do hospital administration, nursing, billing, it's all going to be subject to digitalization. And digitalization does not mean switching from fax to email. That is not digitalization. Digitalization means bringing things together, bringing all these data years together. And they will resemble the internet of healthy things. And this is the fundament of big data. So this is why I need to talk about this in order to understand where big data comes into the place in healthcare. 
And if I talk to my colleagues about this, these are the looks I'm going to get. Wow, well, that is not happening. Yes, it is. And this is the looks I get from politics. Oftentimes you say, well, that's not allowed in Germany. Well, who cares about Germany? We have a European healthcare system, we have a global healthcare system at the end of the day. And this is what's happening. Patients take to their own devices. So they contact physicians, they send their physicals over, and, and, patient, and physicians go over their ideas, go over their vitals. The point, though, is why are not a lot of physicians doing this? Because it's not reimbursed at that point in time. So it's technically possible, but it's not reimbursed. We need to look into how we get this reimbursed. We're probably not going to get this reimbursed on a governmental base, but it's going to be on a self-pay base, which is not bad news at all for a company. So we're looking into a growth potential of about 46% in the next couple of years in telemedicine. And for some industry, the world is not so much under pressure. This is the pharmaceutical industry. For them, the world is still flat, and the, the continents comprise of pills. And these are the key performance indicators of the pharmaceutical industry. That's fair, but, but then again, it's under a lot of scrutiny from the government. And it will eventually also change. So change, what does this mean for the average physician? Well, let me show you this slide here. Here is the pharmaceutical industry. They're doing R&D as they have ever done before. But they're doing fancy stuff now. They're producing 3D printers that actually print pills. So we can print pills. We can print up to 10 different compounds in one pill. So you don't need to take 10 pills. You can take one pill. And we're looking into companies like IBM, we have that, and SAP. They're trying to predict how you will be doing in the rest of your life, what kind of disease you're going to get at the end of the day. And we're looking into energy. Because in Germany, the energy providers have a problem. They're stuck with some stinky nuclear power plants. So they need to find other business models. What they do, they look into healthcare because they say, well, I have 14 million customers. I send power to, I build every month. Well, I can also sell them healthcare insurance or healthcare goods. So this is where the future is going to go. And the guild like structures, like the taxi drivers, they are part of the past. We've been seeing Uber happening a lot of times in Europe and also in Germany. And even for the German pharmacists, the Middle Ages ended mid October 2016. The last part, the last important part the German pharmacists were facing with was in 1322. It's the Edict of Salerno by Frederick II, who said, physicians do what physicians do, pharmacists do what pharmacists do. Now the European court ruled them that a price monopoly for prescribed prescription drugs is not legal. That is a huge turmoil. This is a huge earthquake for them. And you've probably read that in the press that out of 1,600 hospitals in Germany, 1,300 should be closed down due to quality issues. Now, I as a patient want to know whether the hospital, which is next door, is one of these 1,300 that should be closed down because I increase the risk of premature death by going into one of these hospitals. So there's a lot of business models and business opportunities in there, such as Uber running ambulance cars and bringing you to the hospital where your survival and the statistical survival will be higher. So this is scary for a lot of physicians. And the only Uber we have in German healthcare is überhaupt nicht, which means not at all. Yes, not at all. But that's going to change. It's going to change because of technology. And it's going to change because we have the Gutenberg Galaxy and the Golden Village, which has already been predicted in the 1960s. And if we put the hands on our heart, we're all digital natives, aren't we? We were just impeded. We were impeded by kind of these articles. This is an article about in 1984. I dug out when we moved house. It says, well, computers, they will not last. People will still be sticking together and playing music, playing games together, and at the end of the day, you just waste a lot of money and your computer will catch dust and end up in the bin. That's what this article says. This is how I grew up. This is why it was so difficult to get a computer. But then I got one. This was my first computer. Who of you know had one of these two? See, I see something is rising. Let me go further. This is an Atari 2600. 
This is a Commodore 64. I see more people nodding here. And you probably had that one too. And you, when you turned it on, it didn't have a hard drive, but it was an MS-DOS machine. And we used programs like that. That's WordStar 4.0. Probably no word stuff, 4.0. Still in use by the author of Game of Thrones. And this was an, an epitome, an epiphany moment in 1985 when I had my first Windows version on the computer. This is how it all started. And this was the favorite game at that time. You needed to reboot your computer by doing that. Let me look at that closer. If I show this to my, to my children, they tell me, Daddy, the monitor is, is out of order. <laughs> Anybody knows that game? Winter Games, that's right, that is Winter Games. Now, I am a playing aficionado, so I own a PlayStation 4. And we're playing Winter Games with a PlayStation 4, and I have to take a screenshot that I'm going to show you. Look at that, that is, 19, that is 2016. That is 1984. Now the point is, why do I tell you about this? We have the same problem in healthcare, it's about granularity. If you have diabetes, for instance, you measure it twice a day. You could be measuring any second. But the point is, doctors have no idea what that means. If you have a plethora of data points at your hand, they don't know, they can't compute that. They can only compute digital, two, one, two. So this is blood sugar control. Now the question is, which doctor would you rather want to see? This one here, or this one here? And this is where we get into the digital area, the, the, the data-driven area. And that causes a lot of headache, because this is a, a picture of the Internet of Healthy Things. Everything is connected with each other. Even the refrigerator, where you store your butter and everything you eat, because eating behaviors are obviously important to understand blood works. And now let me come to this here. This is not an endorsement, because you can't buy this. They have their back order for a year. This is but this has been done by an Israeli startup. It's about three hundred dollars, and it's a mass spectrometer. You can attach a mass spectrometer with Bluetooth to your smartphone. Now, what what can you do with this? Well, actually, what I do is I go to the supermarket and I put this on melons, and it tells me which of the melons that I have for choice is the sweetest because it measures the carbohydrates in there. But you can do a lot of other things with that. You can measure the the, the proteins in your meat whether there's wheat, in a gluten-free uh, sample, everything. So this is consumer physics, and this will rise and rise and rise, and there will be huge databases for these kind of internet of healthy things. And there will be new professions, for instance, this digital healthcare prospector. It's like the Wild West, a frontier spirit. They're digging for gold in the river of data. So you see these mountains of information and these health hipsters go around in Berlin, you find all these health hipsters with their beards who have founded startup companies and trying to get grips on healthcare. And even the Americans have now taken up a German word, usually we take their words, now they have taken a German word, they call it digital, digital Wanderlust. Now what is Wanderlust? You collect all these kind of data, you have these data together, together, and you don't know what you're up to because you don't know the landscape, you don't know the map. You're just collecting data, and you need to compile this data into information. And of course, the downside is digital summit. Well, they haven't introduced the word summit yet, so I'm trying to push that. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is a digital summit. So, so yeah, yeah. So this is my 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 um, pledge of allegiance for the German language. So proteomics and silicon medicine and algorithmic diagnostics, they point to the future. We collect these kind of data, data points, and we try to scramble them with our algorithms in order to understand what we crave for understanding. And this is always the future. We want to know about the future. And the point is, currently, the current state of digitization reflects a silo like structures for companies that drive it. So you get digital support systems and you get the actual product. That is not right. Because you need somebody to, to convey this information, these assets from outside to the inside. This is what you need. You need scrambled eggs. You need to bring this all together in one for your consumer. Your consumer needs to understand this. And obviously, we understand this is hard for major companies to do this, so we are trying to do this in our own company. We founded a company which is called Phylon Med. And um, we're working in areas that are somewhat neglected, like pediatrics, so kids are your best judges. I have a number of kids at home, and I'm trying a lot of things with them, legal things. 
uh, with them, and uh, they can always tell me whether they love it, like it or not. And so we, for instance, built this pacifier here. Um, the pacifier that measures um, blood um, uh, temperature in the mouth and heart rate and pH in the mouth and so forth. It doesn't run with battery, it's on energy harvesting, it's on sucking and body temperature. Uh, and it's not going to be, in a, we're not going to bring it to the market in Germany. It's a nightmare to, to get it through and to get a lot, in a lot of trouble with dentists. Um, but we're just trying, I'm just trying to exemplify what the internet of healthy things is. Or the internet of healthy things in in pills is a pill dispensing device. How does it work? You put your blister on top in there and it dispenses the medication right at the point you need it. Do we build this in Germany? No, we don't. We build this in Northern Ireland. The Northern Irish government gave us money to build this together with them. Why not Germany? Because it's so regulated and you're fighting with 160 individual sick funds about that. We also look into mass customization in healthcare. What is mass customization? You know, maybe your shoes are size 41. But actually, you don't have 41, you're 41 to a third, probably. So you need a 41 or 42, you're stuck somewhere in between. Go ask your wife, she knows about that. So, mass customization is, yeah, the, the, the shoe fits, and yeah, I get a blister in the first two weeks, but then it's okay. This is how healthcare should be happening. We're probably not be getting into a healthcare that snucks on your hand like a glove, but we're gonna get somewhere where the shoes are. And speaking about shoe industry, Adidas is doing mass customization in healthcare because it's customer binding. If I get them to do my shoes for one or two generations, I will stick with them for the next seven or eight generations. So we're looking into 3D printing of pills. This is the end of branding. Because you're not looking at a brand, you're looking at a compound, and you're looking at the number of compounds here. And most money is being spent on customer, customer satisfaction, customer experience, patient empowerment, and so forth. And why do they do this? Because they want to reduce money in the healthcare system. It's not all about philanthropy, it's about reducing costs in healthcare. And they do this because at the end of 2020, it's supposed that 82.5% 80, 80 no, 80, of all the global populations carrying around a supercomputer, which I was referring to in the beginning as a medical device. And this is a lot of things we can measure there, for good and for bad, I know. So here are all these factors and terabytes of data that we can generate, and terabytes of rubbish if you don't use, uh, know how to use these data. And we, we're seeing implantables, imprintables, and of course impossibles um, that will come to the market. But to give you a flavor of big data, every single day more than 28,000 scientific publications are here. 28,000, you can read all these 28,000. Um, more than 90% of all data available we generated in the last two years from the start of mankind. Just a flavor of where big data is. What can we do? Well, we can work in, this, in um, drug discovery solutions, real world evidence, evidence, population management, specific care conditions, health and wellness, social programs, is unlimited. And is big data new? No, it's not. It's an old hat. Epidemiology has been working with big data for a number of years. Actually, epidemiology helped to discover how cholera works. There was a guy in London about 200 years ago who, who detected cholera cases and he tried to trace them back to wherever they came from. And they had no idea. So he built this huge map, he collected huge data, and he understood, oh, it's actually coming from fountains, from wells. They're poisoned. They didn't know that before. Exactly this is what we're trying to do with big data on a different level. Not just for London, but globally. And then God we trust and everybody else bring your data. This is what statisticians say. And this is what we need to do. So are we remodeling the brain? Well, we are probably trying to rebuild the brain and we are reshaping our brain through this interaction. And why do we do this? You probably love this. Because our brain is trained for pattern recognition. We love pattern recognition. So if you do an algorithm diagnostics and you look at these two pictures, they look alike. But this is San Francisco, rush hour traffic, and this is a brain digital subtraction angiography. So this is a, a radiography of your brain. Obviously, Mother Nature loves to repeat itself and to have patterns. Why is that? That's important because those of our ancestors who did not understand this did not become our ancestors because they were eaten by snakes or lions. And they didn't understand that. This mother tells her little chimp, look, if you see this, this is 
danger. They don't know the left name or the left snake. They don't know how long it's going to be, how long it's going to live. But it's danger because it causes a pattern. And this is what we do too. We look at patterns. And we love looking at patterns. And we love looking at uncomfortable patterns. Like this one here. Or that one. What do they have in common? Nothing. Why are you laughing? Because it's innate. It's deep within your brain. And here we go into some more pictures of um, medical imaging. So, use cases in big health, in, for big data in healthcare. I promise to bring some of these and I'm trying to do some infotainment here. Um, if you open up your computer to researchers and give them two sources to tap into, which might be Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, you Google research, they will know more about yourself than your significant other does, your spouse or somebody else who supposedly knows you well. This is scientific proof here. We can use big data in order to understand what kind of diseases are connected with each other. We don't even need to look into data security here. We programmed a crawler for Medline. And we just wanted to understand what kind of diseases are correlated with each other. This is what we found. We find science bridges. We also find void spaces. And this is where the question then starts. Well, why is there a void space? Was no research funded for that? Is there no correlation? So this is what big data can do for you. And this is what big data can do for healthcare. This is a product of our pharma. We're all looking into a new kind of product. For instance, to carry cancer constantly. But the authorities think we got that. Okay, so there's a wide hiatus. In order to prove that your product is actually worth what you and your marketing department is claiming for, you need to bring evidence. And this evidence can be generated through big data. And for this, we need technology, devices, machines out there. And I have these kind of data on file. This is actually big data saving lives. So people who needed to have a cardiac defibrillator implanted because of a cardiac or the risk of a cardiac arrest, um, they were found out through morphological variabilities in their EKGs. So big data is also saving lives through computer computation generated biomarkers and decision system systems. And this is important because in cardiac diseases, we spend more money, much more money, than in um, oncology diseases. And so this is why we're running these huge databases at that point in time, where we try to find out what kind of behavior is correlated. About, uh, until, about, uh, until 20 years ago, we didn't know there was a connection between smoking and lung cancer. But some people still don't believe in that. But we find out more and more, and this is due to the usage of big data. And this is how the base network, networks are looking like. So this is not a piece of cake, it's not a walk in the park. This is, well, close to rocket science. What's happening in the, the market is this. So people are uh, getting their personalized health test, their genomic test, and then they are trying to adopt their diet. You would be more and more confronted with these personal genetic tests. Is there anybody in the room who dares to say, well, yes, I have performed a genetic test. I'm not going to ask you for a result. I'm just curious whether anybody has done this in the world. Well, I have. Anybody? Okay. Look, this is my genetic setup. Um, so, who am I? Well, I am 99.9% .9 European, out of which I am 41.3% French and German, 11.7% British and Irish, and 26, which equals 21.6. Uh, um, interesting, uh, it equals 100%, okay? But, but here, this is where it gets interesting. 0.1% Mongolian. Now, I, when I got that, I called my mother and asked, uh, Mom, what's that? You didn't have any idea, and of course you didn't have any idea. Um, so being a scientist, I, I dug into some papers and I tried to understand where this came from. Well, the truth is, um, they don't know, but the best explanation is... About 200 years ago, uh, some Mongol had a um, well, physical relationship with one of my grand 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 grandmothers. And this is where this got into our family. Now, why is that still in our family? This kind of innovation. Why do we have this kind of innovation still in our family? Well, here's the news. This is um, the protection against the bubonic plague. So this is how we survived in German, the pest. 
This is the hobby survived the pneumonia plague in the Middle Ages, and it's still there. And obviously, I would say, in most of you, that is also there, because your ancestors survived the bubonic plague as well. I would love to show this um, slide in Dresden to get some understanding that's important to have. Some interference. <laughs> so, data protection and data safety are major challenges, especially in Germany, and this is part of the German angst, so you, you don't want to be tapped. And data travel at the speed of trust. This is important for companies. But data travel and the Technica Kasse, which is the number one player in the SIG fund one in Germany, has given a considerable sum of money to this startup here, and they are doing number crunching and data crunching in order to protect patients. So this is where the future is going to go. And of course, talking about the future, our future our children, big data found out that if you have, if you want to have a three-child family and you want to go without IVF, 90% in vitro fertilization, for 90%, you need to have your first child at age 23, statistically. Okay? If you say, well, uh, I like one child and uh, I want to go with IVF, then you can start at the age of 42. Okay, so these are, this is big data, and there's more to big data. But then again, this is who it's all about. This is the patient. I, I do not want to be tired to show this slide again and again and again. It's not about us loving shiny, fancy objects like that. I love objects like that. My grandma does not. Um, it's about them. And the question is, who are we talking to? Is it customer, client, consumer? What's in the word? And what are we actually doing for the patient? This is a pit crew. It takes five seconds to change tires, pump gas, and pump this guy. It takes five hours for a patient in an emergency room to get the actual treatment. We're looking at uh, inverse Taylorism here. In healthcare still, the patient needs to adapt to the doctor, and not the other way around. So patients are reluctant to asking questions that are important. We know about the door stop, but the doorknob question. If this patient is already leaving, as he hand out the doorknob and says, uh, "Well, actually, doctor, I have an important question. Um, I have bloody diarrhea." That was would have been the most important question to ask in the first place. But patients don't dare, and it's still the model dog food. So the physician is deciding what the patient's going to have tonight. But the roles have changed. Can this is a transfer clinic or a doctor romance story, but not reality. Also, this is not reality anymore. The doctor, the individual doctor, is not a superhero. Even if they, especially surgeons such as myself, want to see themselves as being a superhero. In fact, patients are much more in charge. And I don't know who of you knew that at any given point in time in the hospital with your doctor, it's your complete and full right of information freedom to get your complete chart from the doctor, from the nurses, at any given time. No talk about this, no hassle, it's your legal right. And data ownership is pretty well defined and pretty clear in Germany. You own the data, not your doctor, not your hospital, it's your data. They're just written on paper that is owned by the doctor, by the hospital, but the data are yours. So we have digital restlessness and digital technological helplessness in a lot of physicians, and they are obstacles in the German healthcare system. So how will that power patient look like? Probably like that. Surely not like that. What is that? That is a guy who performed an auto in 1963, a Russian guy, surgeon by training. Uh, they were on, a, on an Arctic um, expedition. There was no other surgeon there, so we knew he'd either be dying or performing an autoappendectomy, so that's what he chose to do. We will be moving from ecosystems to ecosystems. So the Internet of Healthy Things will be will bring new ecosystems. And this is important, it's also important for the ones you are working with. And I'm coming to a close here, so I'll be, I'll be done, you're very restless. I'm, 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 I'll be done in a couple of minutes. So we talked a lot with startups. And in this case, pretty much every company is a startup. Also, the big ones are startups. And what kind of secrets do we tell them? Well, we tell them, you're in the right market. You are in the right market. This is a growing market. Why is that? Because people get older, demographic change, you all know that, but healthcare is a not settled market. And contrary to free beer, you can drink four or five beers, but then it's not good anymore. You can always sleep better, Hear better, have better sex, look better, have clearer skin, whatever. 
And there's money in these markets, because we have peace for 70 years now in the West, so there's money in these markets. And these are digital natives too. They use these computers, they use them as cutting boards maybe, but also they use iPads and others. And it's not just about the quantified self, it's about the qualified self too, because if you measure your data and don't know what to do with these data, they're not good for anything. So big data is only as good as the translation gets. And we need to look into bigger markets, not just fitness. This is going down. We need to look at diabetes, hypertension, heart failure. These are the major markets. And this, uh, these are the markets where we can make a change. So where does innovation come from? We need much more founding spirit and much more entrepreneurship here. We need to find the first movers. We, at the Healthcare Future, we're talking about the courageous penguin. You've probably seen these films on TV where you've got a flock of penguins sitting on an iceberg and they get restless and then one jumps off and all the others jump off too. So the question is, who's going to be the courageous penguin, the first mover? And of course it's dangerous and a shark can come by and cut off a bite off your foot, but then again, you can also find the treasure trove. The treasure trove. This is what we give to the startups um, because we believe in well, showing and sharing pictures. This is a pirate map of the German healthcare system. The Gemeinsame Bundesaus shows the physician joint organization who decides about the money journey is right here. And we have made some tracks on how to get money from them. And sometimes, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, sometimes you need to be a surgeon, you need to roll up your sleeves, you need to do it yourself. This is what we do. We do a lot of hackathons. And our hackathons are called innovate.healthcare, which is also the internet list. Innovate.healthcare. And we've done one about two weeks ago in Hamburg, and here's some impression. We had nine teams who worked on challenges, and out of these nine teams, four are currently founding a company on their own. So if you want to be a health hacker, and if you're interested in this, first one to come up to me, we get this t-shirt. If you're interested in joining one of our hackathons, we'll be having one in Munich, we'll be having one in Heidelberg, and we'll be having one in Cologne in the next year. Come up to me and get this t-shirt. It's XXL. No, it's XL. Okay, healthcare needs to be more playful. More games, more gamification. And I am convinced by using big data, by using the correct approaches, by using more technology, physicians can make much more time available to actually engage with the patient in a way that nobody else can do, in a human way. Not sitting behind a computer, typing in things, but using technology for saving more time for the patient, for a tap on the shoulder, for a hug, for human interaction. Last thing, we have recently compiled a white paper on digital transformation in healthcare. It's about 100 pages long, it's free. If you're interested in that, contact me after that. I'll be around for today. And concluding slide, let us make things happen together. Let us change things. This is my daughter. She always wanted to be on a presentation, so I made her dream come true. Yes, we can. I think we can. You all can do this, and we can do this together. Viva la reformación in healthcare. Thank you very much.